Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. Wes, the regular season is over. The Packers finish at 13-4, and a 37-30 loss to the Detroit Lions on Sunday at Ford Field. Obviously a back-and-forth, up-and-down game. Starters played most of the first half. Packers used a lot of reserves, including at quarterback, and all of that in the second half. The biggest news out of this game, when you look at it from the Packers' perspective, is that left tackle David Bakhtiari and center Josh Myers, the rookie second-round pick out of Ohio State, both returned to the lineup and returned to the starting lineup playing the bulk of the first half. And this is something now to keep an eye on, obviously, with the Packers heading into the playoff bye week, getting ready for the divisional round game coming up here in uh, you know 11 or 12 days, whatever it is. Packers might be getting back to a lot closer to full strength on the offensive line than they've been in quite some time. It was a really interesting post-game Zoom presser because you were listening to David Bakhtiari speaking at the podium to the reporters in Detroit. I was over on the other side of things listening to, to Aaron Rodgers, and Rodgers mentioning that he actually was sort of, I don't want to say coaxing Bakhtiari to play into this, but... He kind of was, though. He sort of was. Yeah. He said on Wednesday he, he kind of put it more in his ear of, do you, you know, maybe to get some reps in this game. Because, honestly, it kind of sounded like, you know, when they, they've been through this process with him, you know, and Bakhtiari said he, he thought it was probably going to be a little bit earlier that he was going to be coming back wanting to make sure that he's ready for the playoffs. And it was Rogers point, And I thought it was a really good one is that, you know, all the talk was all about momentum and it's all about building on what they've done. And certainly there's, there's truth to all of that, but his number one reason to play in that game was because he wanted to get snaps with Josh Myers at center and he wanted to get Bakhtiari back out there. And I think if you check it and just look at it from that perspective, Sunday was a success for David to play 27 snaps. I think Josh Myers ended up playing 32, just a couple more, basically finished out that series. For those guys, missing as much time as they have, and, and it was important that Matt LaFleur pointed out too, Bakhtiari has eight years of reps built up. Josh Myers, even though he actually has played this season, he's only played in four or five NFL games at this point. Yeah. For both of those guys to get out there and the Packers to start figuring out what their best five is for the playoffs – what a benefit. What an opportunity after so much time has been spent this season of them trying to figure out, okay, who are our guys? Who's healthy? Who's available? Well, now you can start to build your best five. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's, uh, that's what's worth watching here as um, this next week and a half goes by. The Packers did decide with Bakhtiari at left tackle and Myers at center that Lucas Patrick, who'd been playing center, moved over to right guard. He started at right guard in place of Royce Newman. And Matt LaFleur um, made a comment on Monday with regard to Lucas Patrick that he is definitely one of the Packers' best five offensive linemen right now. So that tells you that if the coaches decide they feel comfortable and Josh Myers is good to go for the playoffs that Patrick's going to be starting at right guard, and then your next man up at this point on the interior, if anything were to happen at at either of the guard spots, really then becomes the rookie Royce Newman, who obviously has a ton of games under his belt and everything at this point. But if everybody feels good about Bakhtiari and Myers and, and all of this going forward, it looks like the Packers are going to have really, other than, other than, John Runyon, yeah. the Packers are going to have quite a bit a quite a bit of playoff experience um, in their offensive line, and that's even whether it's Dennis Kelly or Billy Turner at right tackle, because Billy Turner potentially could return to practice at some point this week or next, heading into that playoff. Yeah, and, and that's the important key I think for Green Bay here. And as Matt said, it, it isn't just going to be the offensive line; they're going to have to figure this out at a number of different positions. At this point in the season, was this thing moving on me, or was it just me? I think it's it, it it's a little it's loose. Like, it's like a little loose. I'm gonna have to do some <laughs> next time that Marv's doing the shot strictly on you. I gotta do some <laughs> some work on this thing. It's a one man band operation here. <laughs> I thought the thing was falling down. No, but they, they are gonna have to figure this out at cornerback. They're gonna have to figure this out if Cedarius Smith comes back at outside linebacker. Yeah, they've certainly had to figure this out with their receiving core as guys have gotten back. Figuring out 
where to incorporate guys to put the best 11 on the field. An offensive line is one of the very interesting spots where there really isn't much changeover. Once you get your five out there, those are the five guys you're running with. And I think with Patrick specifically, I think one thing a lot of people forget is this is the second longest tenured guy on this offensive line. He's also like the fifth longest tenured guy on the entire roster. Lucas Patrick has a lot of experience built up yep. and served very amicably these last 10 games to start at center to be able to stem this tie to get back to Myers. You tip your cap to him, and I think he's definitely played himself into that conversation. Royce Newman is the future, just like you know John Runyon was the future last year, but yet it was in more of a reserve capacity. The guys who have had to step up have stepped up. The one i got to just give one bit of credit to, though, before we move on is Dennis Kelly. Because this is a guy, Mike, that didn't play a single offensive snap for like three and a half months. Yeah. Since the yeah. regular or the preseason opener against Houston, because then you forget, then he kind of had an injury at the end of camp to when he finally had to go in for Billy Turner in mid December. The guy didn't play on offense. He missed a month with his own injury. I think it was a hip or something like that. And he has not even, I don't know if anybody's even talked about the left side defensive end the last couple of weeks. The guy has just been a stud. And again, it, it just makes all these questions here as Billy Turner comes back, as Bakhtiari gets back comfortable. What is going to be your best five? A much different scenario than what Green Bay was faced with a year ago at this time. Yeah, absolutely. And I totally agree with you with regard to Dennis Kelly. It's it's just, it's interesting looking at, looking at the film. You, you maybe, I don't know if it's as noticeable on TV or not, but, uh, but Dennis Kelly is just such a big guy. Like, Huge. You know, and, and now... This last game when you had Dennis Kelly at right tackle and then you have Bakhtiari back there at left tackle with, you know, with his wide stance and the big kick step that he takes, you know, with regard to pass protection and everything. You see those two guys on the edges and it's like, you know, holy cow. That's taking nothing away from Billy Turner. If Turner steps back in there at at, uh, at right tackle, he's got the, you know, that wide kick step to the other side. Yeah. I mean, these guys are these guys are such are such big bodies and the Packers the Packers are fortunate to have this much experience that they can choose from here heading in heading into the postseason. Yeah, Bakhtiari and Myers obviously they have to get their game conditioning back. They have to be ready to play 50, 60, you know, maybe even 70 snaps depending on how things go. And that's really the tricky part here because whether you're talking about Randall Cobb coming back, Jair Alexander coming back, maybe Zadarius Smith coming back, those guys can be worked in um, to you know, to certain packages, you can substitute them in, have yeah. a few plays here, and then you know, they you don't necessarily have to ask those guys to go play 60 snaps right away. On the offensive line, you don't necessarily want to be shuffling things around series to series, quarter to quarter, half to half, whatever. It was fine to do that against the Detroit Lions when the Packers didn't need to win the game, but the conditioning of those guys will be will be the key as to whether they are ready to go for the playoffs. And could you tell just how much that game meant to David Bakhtiari? And it, and just the fact that he was able to get back out there. Evan Siegel had a great shot of him during the I think it was the national anthem or some point during warmups. A very emotional, a very reflective David Bakhtiari looking back on that. Our team at Packers.com, our video department, and David put together a fantastic uh, kind of funny, humorous video of his big yeah. comeback that I know they'd been working that on. Was, that was great. That was fantastic. But when it comes down to it, this is a guy that has put and dedicated so much time to his craft. As, as humorous and as funny as he likes to be, it was a very serious moment for him to be back out there. And as Aaron Rodgers said, extremely proud of him that he was able to get those snaps under his belt. And you would hope whenever that divisional playoff game comes around here in a week and a half, that Bakhtiari will be able to lean back on those experiences and feel confident again in that knee and where he's at. Well, on Sunday, the Detroit Lions were a two-win football team with nothing to lose. And as I said, during the game, as I said in Insider Inbox, they absolutely played like it. They yeah. tried a fake punt early in the game. Packers were able to defend that. They tried a couple of trick plays, both of which worked for long touchdowns. Packers had their ups and downs offensively. You would have liked to have seen when the first unit was in there with Rodgers. You'd like to see them capitalize off of the, the fake punt and get yep. some points there. That didn't happen. Rodgers still was able to throw two touchdown passes to Alan Lazard before halftime. Um, second half, Jordan Love up and down, led some, led some scoring drives, got the big screen pass for a touchdown. I believe the Packers scored 17 points if I'm not mistaken, yes. with, uh, with Love at yep. quarterback. Two touchdowns and a field goal. But then in the two-minute situations at the end of the game, um, things didn't work out. Defensively, um, 
defensively again a lot of uh, a lot of ups and downs the, the the trick plays seem to kind of put the Packers on their heels um, defensively and uh, and and Matt LaFleur not happy with uh, with the defensive performance this is not what he wanted to see out of his defense heading into the playoffs and yes in the second half there were a lot of substitutions and a lot of guys you know running in and out but there were some there were some moments there in the first half where Matt LaFleur wanted to see his defense really step up and that didn't and that didn't happen and he wasn't uh, he wasn't happy about that afterwards. Yeah. The the most regrettable part of this thing I think were the trick plays uh, cuz that's where a lot of the explosives kind of came off of for Detroit. You can understand why Matt LaFleur would be a little frustrated about that because ultimately whoever ends up being their divisional round opponent, they're going to go back and look at that and be like, okay, is there something that we're going to be able to take advantage of here on right. these guys? Right, exactly. Now, I would offer into evidence, and, and I, I, an insider inbox reader put this better than I ever could. We talked the entire season about what Devondre Campbell has meant to this defense, how important he's been as the quarterback, as the guy that has 150 tackles in 15 games or whatever it ended up being. When you take him out of the equation, the defense changes. You'd be remiss not to admit that. That being said, in the adverse situations, in the explosives, in the the adversity moments, Green Bay didn't respond well enough to that. That's going to be where they need to find, you know, a little bit more um, consistency. They came out of halftime. I actually thought they played pretty well. Got a couple, you know, consecutive three and outs that they earned. Yeah, that was that was where it felt like the you know the defense the defense was stepping up and yes. potentially changing things. But then after that, you know, the Packers kind of pulled out some of their pulled out some of their yeah. main guys and 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 went with the uh, went with the backups and then uh, and then in the fourth quarter the Lions were able to put together that 75 yard touchdown drive that uh, that gave them the lead for good. And this is where I agree with Aaron Rodgers because you can create whatever narrative you want out of this going into the divisional round game and if they win a Super Bowl you can say well they took the right approach. The way I look at it though, I think this game actually gave Green Bay everything that they needed. You know, you had a good start. You got the fast start offensively, right? 13 plays, 74 yards. They've had a hard time on that first scoring drive. They got that taken care of. They had some drives there that were regrettable. Then the offense finishes on a high note with that scoring drive right before halftime. Defensively, they got kicked in the teeth a little bit. Yeah. I think that's something that can kind of be sort of a wake-up call for them, understanding what the standard is and understanding what they have to accomplish in this first playoff game. That being said, the only thing I will say about what Detroit did is to me, it seemed like you were kind of playing your little brother in Madden, and the little brother was just like, all right, I'm going to pull out every trick in the book. I have nothing to lose. There is no tomorrow. And, you know, you got, you got hit on a couple things. If the Detroit Lions were playing to get in the playoffs, I think you see a little bit different offensive game plan for what they tried to do. Yep. Now, I will admit, and I will submit into evidence, the fake punts are nothing new for Dan Campbell. This is the way he runs this thing. But you do kind of drive the car a little bit differently if you don't care about what the car is going to look like at the end of the season. So (laughs) that's the only thing I would offer. Not saying that teams in the playoffs here can't try some of that trickeration on Green Bay, but the stakes are much, much higher than they were in week than what Detroit had in week 18. Yeah, I, I, uh, I totally agree with you there. A little shout out to our sponsors, Wes. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl. Cousin Subs, we believe in better. I'm going to close on this because I don't know if we're going to transition away from the game. Uh, I would be also remiss if I didn't talk about Amon Ross St. Brown really quick. The Packers just don't, you know, there's been some a lot of upheaval with the head coaching positions, certainly different quarterbacks that have gone through. Green Bay never seems to catch a break in terms of the receiver position in this division. I mean, you look at all the guys that, you know, whether it was Kenny Galladay for years, Megatron was a constant problem. And then you got Amon Ross St. Brown coming through town. I mean, that guy, he's going to be somebody to keep an eye on here in these years to come. I just wanted to, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that before we got out of that game. Yeah. He sure looks like he's the next uh, go-to receiver for, uh, for the Detroit. He's going to catch a hundred passes a year once he figures everything out. Holy cow. Yeah. That he's, um, um, he is a, he is a young, he's a young talent to watch while the Detroit lions are looking to build something here with, with Dan Campbell. They certainly, they certainly have the uh, have the fire and the attitude. We talked about it all season long. How the Lions played hard, and yeah, yeah they lost a lot of close games, and yeah, they they lost a couple blowouts too. They weren't necessarily in every game, but Dan Campbell had those guys playing really hard. The Lions are looking to build something while 
the uh, the Bears and the Vikings both in the NFC North looking to completely start over, not only moving on from their head coaches, but their uh, their GMs as well. Matt Lafleur is suddenly the longest tenured That's head crazy. coach in uh, in the NFC North, just as he finishes his uh, his third season here. I want to take a look at the playoff picture, and we'll get into more specifics about some of these matchups, especially in the NFC, on our next show later this week. But I have to get your thoughts even before I go to the NFC about that Raiders-Chargers game on Sunday night, which, as I'm sure you all know, the setup was that the winner was going to go to the playoffs, the loser was going to be out, but... Because the Colts had lost to the two-win coming-in Jaguars and essentially blew their playoff spot with what should have been a uh, as easy a win-to-get-in game as you could ask for in a league like the NFL, the scenario was available in which if the Raiders and Chargers tied, played to an overtime tie, they would both get in and that would keep the Pittsburgh Steelers out. The Steelers looking to steal the last spot that, yeah. the, uh, that the Colts had let get away. And lo and behold, it almost did play to an overtime tie. What, what were you thinking watching that? You know, it wasn't even so much what I was thinking when I was watching it. It was everything that happened afterwards. Like, I don't know if you've seen that clip, but that clip of Austin Eckler talking to, I don't even know which member that was of the, the Las, or Las Vegas Raiders, where you can kind of you know, do some lip reading there, and then literally like the guy tells him, yeah, we were you know, basically going to kneel. And then L.A. calls the timeout. I, you've said it a number of different times, and we even you know, looked at the NFL and analyzed things. These are all decisions that have to get made in the split second, yep. in an instant. But sometimes coaches overthink these things. Yeah. And for Brandon Staley, who, by the way, is one of the brightest defensive minds in the game today, has an incredible history, probably in terms of you looking like an indoctrination into defense, has gotten the best education of maybe anyone in NFL recent NFL history. And you call timeout there. When it looks like Raiders are just going to be content to run this thing. Because the thing no one I don't think really has been talking about is the Raiders had a lot to lose there too. If you make a mistake, if there's an interception, if yeah. there's if there's a fumble return, even lining up for a field goal, I mean, there was yeah. a blocked field goal that gets taken the other way. You know, there there's there's risk there. There there was way more risk to the Raiders lining up for that field goal than there was to just yeah. to just take a knee. And I think there was I think there was a sense. I think there was a sense. Now the Raiders still just handed the ball off on third and four. Yep. They didn't necessarily change exactly what they were going to do. I'm still not sure if they would have necessarily taken a knee uh, before the timeout was called. Maybe they would have. But there was a sense that because the timeout was called with 38 seconds left, that the Raiders had to be like, all right, we we can't we can't just kneel on it because maybe they want the ball back yeah. and then they're going to try to throw a pass and kick a field goal. So or they're going to make us punt. You know, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so it's like have, you have to, you have to still try to play to win. And, uh, and then the, the chargers, Brandon Staley says after the game, he calls the timeout because he wants to get his best run defense on the field, knowing that the Raiders were going to run the ball. Well, your best run it. defense gave up a 10 yard run that turned a 57 yard field goal into a 47 yard oh. one. And uh, and now you're going home in your season. It it was an absolutely unprecedented situation. Never seen anything like it before. <laughs> an unbelievable comeback by Justin Herbert, the Chargers quarterback. They survived six fourth downs to a, uh, in in the span of multiple possessions to keep that game alive. Five of them with pass completions, one with a defensive penalty. Surviving six fourth downs, any one of those would have essentially ended the game and ended their season, and they stayed alive all the way until the final snap when that kick went through the uprights. It was it, it was uh, it was absolutely incredible. It's what theater. I said to you a couple weeks ago, Mike. You got to get Justin Herbert now. Because in five, <laughs> ten years, this kid is going to be something else. I said it. La I said it last week. The 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 Raiders, as it turned out, the Raiders did the rest of the AFC playoff field a favor, in my opinion, by getting Justin Herbert out of they there. They really did because, and, and because, because I, he's a quarterback who could who could get hot and go on a run wherever you ask the Chargers to play. And without being disrespectful to the Raiders, I think it says a lot about the the job that you know that that coaching staff that's been left over there has done. You know, certainly Edgar Bennett, who's been there now for a number of years. 
but I don't know if anyone's fearing facing Vegas. With Austin Eichler back from the COVID list, with Justin Herbert playing the way that he's playing right now, man, that is a dangerous football team. And because of how everything shuffled out, they are not going to be in the party this year. So yeah. I think there's probably a lot of teams in the AFC that are happy about that. Yeah, well, on the NFC side, the way things shook down, the San Francisco 49ers did beat, in another very dramatic game, they beat the Los Angeles Rams coming back from 17 nothing down, then having to come back from seven points down in the final two minutes to get the game to overtime. The Niners win in overtime to get into the playoffs as a wild card. So here it is. The seventh-seeded Philadelphia Eagles will be at the two-seeded Tampa Bay Buccaneers. San Francisco is the sixth. They will play at the three-seed Dallas. And then Arizona and the Rams, meeting number three of the NFC West rivals, will be the five versus the four uh, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the NFC wildcard games. And from the Packers' perspective, it's really kind of simple from a, from a timeline perspective, the way, the way the games lined up in the schedule, because the Eagles and Buccaneers are first. Yep. If the Eagles win, they're coming to Lambeau Field. If the Buccaneers win, then you turn your attention to San Francisco and Dallas. If San Francisco wins, the Niners are coming to Lambeau Field. If they don't, and if Dallas wins, then it all comes down to that Monday night, the Cardinals and Rams, and the winner of that Monday night wildcard game between Arizona and L.A. would be the team coming to Lambeau Field. So there's sort of a, a sequence to it yes. if, you're, if you're a Packer fan in terms of how you follow this. Very different from last year, if you remember, when <laughs> well, I remember when uh, when the the Rams as an as a road wild card had beaten Seattle, but then from the Packers' perspective, we had to wait until the Bears, who were the seven seed and were playing the next day, the Bears had to lose in order for the Rams to come yeah. to Lambeau Field. If the Bears had won, it would have been the Bears coming to Lambeau. So there was. There, it, the sequence was different. It was there. There was more uncertainty to it. This one, it's just going to be one game at a time. Maybe you're going to find out right yeah. here. Maybe not, and then you go to the next game. And uh, so the Packers might know their opponent um, at some point on late Sunday afternoon or early Sunday evening, or they might not know their opponent until very late in the evening on. Monday night, if it takes that long to uh, to decide, this it's it's an interesting situation, and obviously with a Monday night wild card game for the first time ever, it's a, it's a situation that hasn't really presented itself before. Just before I get into that, has a team that went to the playoffs a year ago ever seemed so far away removed from that playoff run than the Chicago Bears this year? <laughs> I mean, I understand some things had to fall their way to get into the, the Yeah, that was that was year. an eight and eight Bears team that got the newly created seventh That's seed, cool. you know, to yeah. get in and then they weren't even they weren't even competitive in, in their playoff game as the as yeah, the seventh I, seed. To be honest, yes, I then it, it uh, then with a new quarterback and everything. Yeah. New quarterbacks, I yeah. guess I should say. It still didn't work out in Chicago. Okay, let's talk about this thing. I I'll be honest with you, Mike. Uh, we have a bye this week. We're still working quite a bit. We'll still have some access this week. But the weekend is going to be kind of open to us. The weekend is our oyster in terms of how we want to do this. <laughs> right. Y you're, you're the guru with the playoff stuff and all that. I'm telling you right now, I'm not watching the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and, and Eagles game. I just won't be. There's a four-year-old running around that needs some attention. I'm going to probably run some errands. I will be glued to the television for that 3:30 matchup between San Francisco and Dallas on Sunday. Yeah. Even if even if Philly pulls the upset, I want to see that San Francisco team against a Dallas team that has looked like a world beater at parts of the season, but also looked fallible at other times. Where yep. you get San Francisco, as I've said over and over again, I think is the most dangerous team in this entire field in terms of where they are relative to their that, seed. That, that's how I've felt the second half of the season. And, and things are so tenuous because of this injury that Jimmy Garoppolo is dealing with. Yeah. And that that two-minute drive uh, with three absolutely incredible throws that Garoppolo made on that game-tying drive against the Rams to get that game to overtime, that was phenomenal. You would not know for a second that Garoppolo was dealing with any kind of an injury when you, when you look at those throws. But again... This is football. If his hand hits somebody's helmet or, you know, a pass rusher tries to reach out and knock the ball and his hand gets in an awkward position, this could all, you know, it could all completely change in an instant for the 49ers if any sort of aggravation to that injury with Garoppolo. That being said, this is a roster in San Francisco that is playoff experience, that is playoff tested, 
And coming back from 17 down on the road against a division rival when your season is on the line, this is now a San Francisco team that, that believes it can do anything. That, that if, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm Kyle Shanahan, I be, I'm believing my team is capable of anything. And this, this is point. a team that has a chip on its shoulder, man. They, they made that Super Bowl run, and then everybody, and they just had all these injuries, just injury after injury after injury, and, and they've had to deal with that. I, I think that, hey, we're finally back to where we need to go. We need to be able to make a run here in order to do it, but I think that's a very dangerous team. And then also, I mean, certainly you have the New England Patriots and Buffalo Bills facing off for the 14th time this year I think that's going to be a really intriguing game to watch and then it all comes down to Monday night if if San Francisco doesn't pull the upset if Philly doesn't pull the upset then the Green Bay Packers will be sitting there for the first ever Monday night football playoff game waiting to see who their opponent is going to be yeah well unlike you I will be watching the Eagles and the Buccaneers because your kids are graduated (laughs) well partly yes But if the if the Eagles do pull off the upset, I have to be ready to write something very quickly to put on Packers.com I that the Eagles are coming to Lambeau Field. So I got to be watching. I got to be ready. That's okay. I you offered can, to help. You, you need. I offered you to did. help. You did. I'm just. I'm giving you a hard time. Spend uh, spend Sunday with your uh, <laughs> with your four year old for as long as you can. Um, but I, I it's it's an interesting it's an interesting slate of wild card games. I'll be honest with you. Um, I. I really liked it as much as I wasn't crazy about the seventh team being added to the playoffs. I really liked it last year when it was yeah. three games on Saturday and three on Sunday. There was there was a there was a rhythm and a symmetry to that. The fact that uh, and especially because it could impact you know the, the Packers knowing their situation. The fact that there's now a wild card game on Monday night just it just doesn't it just doesn't feel right to me. Um, it, it's not really how this is. Uh, there, there there's a reason. Uh, there's a reason playoff games in the NFL have always been played on Saturdays and Sundays. So um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to be uh, too keen on Monday Night Football in the postseason. But uh, but it's here, and I guess we have to deal with it. It, it. The biggest thing is I'm just holding out judgment on this, and and unfortunately we only we only have purchased about another five minutes of time here in the studio before we have to get out. But yeah. Uh, the the reason I'm holding out judgment is I just want to see how they lay out the divisional round games. If it ends up being that the team's playing on Sunday or then playing on Saturday and then the Monday night game is playing on Sunday, I'm okay, I think I'll be okay with it. Just from the standpoint of it, it, somebody's going to end up getting the short end of the stick there. That being said, it just seems, again, I've warmed up. I even wrote this in inbox. I've warmed up to the 14-team playoff field because I think it really does give a real advantage now to the conference champion of the regular season. I, that makes sense to me. I actually am with that. But we just – one thing is never good enough. We always got to kind of futz <laughs> yeah. with it a little bit, and, and I feel like that Sunday night football – if you could play the Monday game at noon on Monday, I think, okay, maybe it makes a little sense. But you play – one team's playing at, what, freaking noon on Saturday and another's playing on Sunday well, night. Well, the first game on Saturday is not till 3.30. 3.30. So, but, yeah, that's that's the one that's – the basically the noon Saturday wild card game from last year has been shifted – yeah, to to, Monday, to night uh, Monday night with uh, with the other five windows time windows on Saturday and Sunday the same as they were a year ago but uh, but yeah um, we're out of, we're out of time we, we got to get out of the studio because there's people waiting for us to leave so we're gonna call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team we've got it all for you on Packers.com for Wes I'm Mike thanks for tuning in everybody we'll see you next time.